Science! Welcome to Science This Week. First up, let's check in with NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Um, we talked about this a couple times on this very science segment. In fact, when it got launched uh, last year. And uh, it is now completed its second orbit around the sun. It was launched actually on August 12th of 2018. And um, while Earth has only made a single trip around the sun, the Parker Solar Probe has one around twice. And it's going into and well into its third orbit right now. Dr. Nikki Fox, the director of Heliophysics Division at NASA headquarters, said, We are very happy. We've managed to bring down at least twice as much data as we originally suspected we'd get from those first two perhelion passes, which is really exciting. The Parker Solar Probe carries uh, a suite of scientific instruments to gather data on the particles, the solar wind plasma, the electric and magnetic fields, solar radar emission, the structures of the corona, everything that we've observed from afar forever uh, with our, our own sun, but now getting to observe up close, which is really cool. And this information is actually going to help solar scientists unravel the physics driving the extreme temperatures in the corona and the mechanisms that drive particles and plasma out into the solar system. And one of the biggest questions... Ha always, you know, even myself, when they when they launched this, was how the hell are we going to launch something that's going to orbit the sun and isn't going to freaking melt, right? Um, I have a really fun video directly from NASA that explains exactly why the Parker Solar Probe won't melt. Right here. NASA's Parker Solar Probe is a mission to explore the sun. How can it do that? Why won't the spacecraft melt? Excellent question. You can't face off with the sun without packing the right gear. This is why Solar Probe is equipped with a white shield that reflects heat off the front and keeps things cool in the back. The heat shield is made out of a couple of different materials. One is carbon carbon, which is a lot like the graphite epoxy you might see in your golf clubs or your tennis racket, but it's just been superheated. The inside is a carbon foam, um, which is just another form of carbon and is actually about 97% air. It's a very lightweight way of making a very strong structure. Nobody likes a needy explorer. Solar Probe can take care of itself, thank you very much. And that's because it has autonomy software that will keep its instruments safe and cool behind the heat shield. We're too far away to joystick it into place, so it basically has to always be sensing whether or not uh, the heat shield is in the right position and correct itself if it isn't. There are these things called solar limb sensors that are just poking out at the very edge of the shadow. And if those get illuminated, the spacecraft knows, oh, I'm you know, going the wrong direction and can actually right itself. It's important to stay hydrated in the sun, even for a spacecraft. Solar Probe circulates water to keep the solar cells from overheating. It stays cool and keeps power. So basically water flows behind the solar rays and into the radiators. And so the water warms up when it's uh, behind the solar cells and then cools down up at the radiators. And so that heat transfer is happening a lot like the veins in your body. Yes, you read right. Heat is not the same as temperature. Temperature is a measurement, but heat is energy transfer. This matters because Solar Probe will be visiting the sun's outer layer, the corona. Like all stars, the sun is made of plasma. How tightly packed that plasma is depends on the layer. While the sun's corona has a very high temperature, the plasma particles are fairly spread out. So even though the temperature in the corona is two to three million degrees Fahrenheit, the heat around the spacecraft is manageable. The corona and where we're going is actually not that dense at all. There are only a couple particles. And so when we think about it, those are very hot, but we're not touching a lot of them. It's the kind of like when you put your hand into an oven, and the oven might be at four or 500 degrees Fahrenheit, but your hand isn't at 400 or 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Thanks to its design and destination, this cool, confident spacecraft is all set to explore. We can just sit back and chill as Parker's Solar Probe takes the heat. Really interesting stuff. And uh, it's, again, when I say this, I truly mean it. It's awesome to live in the future because, you know, 50 years ago, we couldn't have even 
like even to begin to think about sending something to the sun with the tech we had then, but now we can, and we're learning all this new data every single day about our own sun and the stars in the universe, which is really cool. Um, the Parker Solar Probe project scientist, Dr. Noir Ryofi, and from the, he's actually from the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, said, the data we're seeing from Parker Solar Probe's instruments is showing us details about solar structures and processes that we have never seen before. Flying close to the sun, a very dangerous environment, is the only way to obtain this data, and the spacecraft is performing with flying colors. Now, the researchers also created a video showing solar wind structures as they streamed out of the sun. This is this seven-second clip is just stitched together from a bunch of data from the Parker Solar Probe, and I'm going to play it and kind of walk through as like to explain what it is. The scientists actually explained this video, which spans November 6th through 10th of 2018, combines views from Parker Solar Probe's WISPR telescopes during the spacecraft's first solar encounter. The sun is out of frame past the combined image's left side, so the solar wind flows from left to right past the view of the telescopes. The bright structure near the center of the left edge is what's known as a streamer, a relatively dense, slow flow of solar wind coming from the sun, originating from near the sun's equator. The video appears to speed up and slow down throughout the movie because of the ways data is stored at different points at the Parker Solar Probe's orbit. The Milky Way's galactic center is visible on the right side of the video. That's that large, dark mass. That is literally the center of our galaxy. And then the planet that's visible on the left is Mercury. The thin white streaks in the images are particles of dust passing in front of the WISPR's cameras. Uh, and that's what's really, really interesting is the amount of data we're getting from the Parker Solar Probe. Um, it's so interesting in the entire scientific community because it's answering questions and posing new ones about the stars in the universe. We know so little about them because all of them are very far away except for our own sun. And we've never even been very close to our own sun until now. So it's really cool that the Parker Solar Probe is out there and doing its job, and it's going to continue to do a bunch more orbits until it one day will actually go directly into the sun, which is going to be pretty exciting as well. So now let's head back down to Earth and some archaeological news. This is uh, some something straight out of a horror movie. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of a place on in the world called Skeleton Lake, uh, but new DNA evidence is deepening the mystery of this, this ghastly scene. It's called Rupkund. It's a remote lake high in the Indian Himalayas and is home to one of archaeology's spookiest mysteries, the skeletons of up to as many 800 people. Now, there's a new study pu published in Nature Communications that attempts to unravel what happened at Skeleton Lake? And the results are actually raising even more questions than answers. A forest ranger stumbled across the ghostly scene during World War II, and explanations of why hundreds of people died there have varied and abounded throughout the years. There are many different ideas. Maybe they were invading Japanese soldiers. Maybe there was an Indian army returning from the war. Maybe there was a king and his party of dancers struck down by a righteous deity. A few years ago, a group of archaeologists suggested, after inspecting the bones and dating the carbon within them, that the dead were travelers caught in a lethal hailstorm around the 9th century. We'll actually talk a little bit more about that in a minute. In the early 2000s, preliminary DNA studies had suggested that the people that died at Rupkund were of South Asian ancestry, and radiocarbon dates from around the site cluster around 800 AD, and, and there were signs that they all died in a single event. But now, full genomic genomic analysis from 38 sets of skeletal remains update that story. 
The new results show that there were 23 people with South Asian ancestry at Rupkund, but they died during one or several events between the 7th and 10th century AD. What's more is the Rupkund skeletons contain another group of 14 victims who died there a thousand years later, likely in a single event, maybe around the 1800s. And unlike the later South Asian skeletons, the earlier group at Rupkun had a genetic ancestry tied to the Mediterranean, Greece and Crete to be exact. An additional individual the, whose bones were, were um, analyzed, who died at the same time as the Mediterranean group, had East Asian ancestry. None of these tested individuals were related to each other. And additional isotopic studies confirm that the South Asian and Mediterranean groups ate different diets. So tons and tons of different mysteries. Study co-author Naraj Rai, an archaeogeneticist at the Birbal Sinai Institute of Paleosciences in Lucknow, India, said, We have tried to answer all possible sources of genetic ancestries of the Rupkun skeletons, but failed to answer why Mediterranean people were traveling to this lake and what they were doing there. Knowing that some of the bones at Rupkun came from a slightly unusual population still doesn't shake the fundamental mystery. How hundreds of people's remains ended up at one remote mountain lake. You know, normal history dictates if you find a large cache of bones, it's usually a graveyard. Whether that graveyard is planned and people were buried there or it's a battle site and people died in battle. Um... But that doesn't, neither of those seem to be the case with this strange skeleton lake. But what if a local folk song actually memorializes how the victims died? This song describes a royal procession during the Raj Jat, a pilgrimage held in the region every 12 years to worship the goddess Nanda Devi that defiled the holy landscape with dancing girls. In response, an enraged Nanda Devi struck down the group of individuals with iron balls thrown from the sky, so the song goes on to describe. One tantalizing possibility is that the Rupkun victims were pilgrims who died during the Rajat after getting caught in a severe hailstorm. Parasols, or umbrellas, of a type were dur- used during the procession were reportedly found among the remains, and some individual skulls bear unhealed fractures, perhaps a sign of large hailstones from the song's iron balls, maybe. Did the Mediterranean group come from Rajat pilgrimage and then stay at the lake long enough to meet their ends there? William Sachs, who's the head of the Heidelberg University's anthropology department and author of a book on that exact pilgrimage, says that this type of scenario absolutely wouldn't make any sense. Sachs has made three trips to the lake, most recently in 2004 as part of a National Geographic television show, and says that modern pilgrims pay it little attention. I'm actually going to go look up that show because that sounds really, really interesting. And if you have National Geographic or access in the Nat Geo channel, I'm, I will guarantee that that show is on there. Their archives are great. Sachs went on, went on to say, when pilgrims get up to Rupkund, they're scrambling because they have much farther to go. So they sort of stop and briefly show a bit of respect, if you will, but it's not and never has been terribly important for the pilgrimage itself. It's kind of a dark and dirty place where you sort of nod your head and move on. Researchers have plans to further unravel Rupkun's mysteries. Rai says that next year, in 2020, another expedition will visit the lake to study artifacts associated with the skeletons. And hopefully, that next expedition will shed some light on some answers instead of more questions. But you're darn right I'm going to talk about it probably again right here on this science segment.